my father, who's 78 now, had a massive heart attack when he was 49. It's, we're fortunate he's lived this long, but now he can't park his car and walk two blocks to get to his office on his own. For so many human conditions, the fundamental problem is that your body has lost a set of cells that it needs for a certain function, and we have no way to replace those cells. All we can do is tinker around the edges, and, but we can't get to the root of the problem and replace those cells. That's the human condition in 2015, and I say that's unacceptable. Instead, imagine with me a world where for so many human conditions, be it spinal cord injury, Parkinson's, diabetes, uh, and heart disease, as I mentioned, that we don't accept that, but we're somehow able to create new cells within your organ to get to the root of the problem and actually restore that organ's function. That is the world that we're headed into, and I'm going to explain to you in the next 10 minutes how we're going to do that and what the solution might be. That solution really starts with a revolution that's been going on the last several years in the world of stem cells. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard about stem cells in the news. There's been the source of ethical debate and a lot of hope and promise because these are cells that we think might be able to rejuvenate damaged organs for so many human diseases. The story I'm going to tell you today, though, is based on knowledge we've gained from stem cells that, have, that has allowed us to, if you will, uh, hack the code of life. And we're using that code now to go beyond just using stem cells to regenerate organs uh, into a whole nether world that is based on stem cells, but actually doesn't even involve stem cells. And that's what I'd like to focus my comments on today. But before I do that, you need to understand a few key principles based on stem cells that have allowed us to hack this code. So there are only two things that define an, a stem cell that we call is pluripotent, which means it can turn into every cell type in the human body. And only embryonic stem cells have really have that capacity to be pluripotent. So the two features are that every time that cell divides, one of the two cells it's divided into is identical to the parent. So it can keep dividing and making more and more of itself indefinitely. The other feature is that this, the other cell that occurred when it divided has the potential to turn into all the different cells of the human body, over 200 different cell types. And it does so by going through progressive stages of being restricted in what it can become until it becomes one of your adult cells in your body, be it a gut cell, a muscle cell, or a brain cell. Now, you might see this diagram and realize that the cell at the top must have the exact same DNA code as any of the cells at the bottom that know what they're going to be. So how is it that with the exact same DNA, you get such vastly different cells? Well, it turns out we've largely figured that out now, and we know that the DNA in any given cell encodes about 25,000 or so different genes, and those genes get turned into proteins. And the only difference between a muscle cell and a gut cell or a brain cell is that in each of those, only about 5,000 of those 25,000 genes are actually being turned on and activated, and the other 20,000 are being silenced. So the difference between any cell in your body is that there's a different set of 5,000 that are on and 20,000 that are off in each cell, and that's it. That's it. That's the difference. So you can imagine if you knew how to flip the switches on and off on the 5,000 you want on and the 20,000 you want off, you could control the fate of any cell in your body. You could change one cell type into another almost at will. But of course, that seems complicated, doesn't it? You'd have to flip 25,000 different switches, and how do you really do that? It's not, it's, a, it's not a very feasible problem. It turns out that nature has built simplicity into the system. So that what we now are realizing is that each cell in your body has sort of a core machinery of master regulators that will set off a chain reaction. And 
change the DNA all along a chromosome, whole cells switching which things are on and off, and in most cell types, a combination of three or four master control points can set off the whole chain reaction so that you get 5,000 genes turn, being turned on, 20,000 new ones being silenced, and you can change the fate of a cell almost at will if you can figure out what those three or four master genes are. This is remarkable. It's finally given us in our hands the source code, if you will. If you imagine the DNA being the hardware and how you interpret it being the software, we're starting to figure out the software. The real breakthrough in this field came a few years ago from one of my colleagues at the Gladstone Institute, Shinya Yamanaka, when he found that a combination of just four of these master regulators could reprogram an adult skin cell, a support cell in the skin that we call a skin fibroblast. When you put these four genes in, you could turn that skin cell into a cell that was pluripotent, just like an embryonic stem cell. It could turn into all the different cell types of the human body. And now you could take these cells and then direct them into becoming the cell type you want, and maybe you could transplant those into, back into a patient, and they wouldn't reject it because it's their own DNA, it's their own cells. Or you could use those cells to actually discover a drug that was affecting a disease in that cell. Say, if you have Alzheimer's, ideally we'd want to find a drug that affected the Alzheimer's, the, a brain cell, and we could correct that, but we need a brain cell from you in the dish in front of us, and obviously we can't take a brain biopsy. But now we could take your skin cells, turn it into your brain cell, and test if a drug could work on your brain cell. And just to give you an example of what these cells might look like, what you see here is a sheet of beating heart cells that are electrically connected and beat in synchrony, just like your heart does, and these cells used to be on somebody's skin. This is like science fiction but we we're able to do that. And you can imagine if we can do this, we might be able to take a heart that's been damaged like you see here where the blue is, represents scar that replaces the nice red muscle and inject these cells into that scar area and try to get restore the lost cells in the heart. It turns out that we're trying to do that, but it's been rather difficult to get cells to survive when we put them in and integrate electrically so they beat in unison, but we're trying to do it. But a few years ago, we took advantage of another observation, and that is, in the human heart, half of the cells in your heart are actually not even muscle. They're these support cells that I mentioned earlier, the fibroblast, but they're there, and they're also the ones that get activated to form that blue scar that you see there. And we asked, if we can take a fibroblast and turn it into a stem cell and then a heart cell, what if we could take that fibroblast that's already in your organ and it's going to make scar, and trick it so it doesn't make scar, but instead turns directly into muscle without ever becoming a stem cell. Could we do that? Could we get that code that's key? And so to do that, we took advantage of two decades of work that our lab and other labs had done that were meant to figure out how does nature normally make a heart in an embryo? What's the code that nature uses? And we've largely figured that out. And we asked, can we redeploy some of that code into these scar-forming cells and get them to switch their fate. And remarkably, it turned out that a combination, in this case, of just three genes that are critical for formation of a heart in an embryo, if we reintroduce in these scar-forming cells, could switch those cardiac fibroblasts now into new cardiac muscle right there in your organs. So we're not even putting any cells in. We're taking the cells that are your own already there and just converting them. And we first did this in the mouse, where we can tie off a coronary artery and create a heart attack in a mouse. And then we inject these three genes into the heart. And a month later, we can take the heart out and cut it in slices and look at it under the microscope, but also break it up into single cells, like what you see on this slide. And here we've taken advantage of a genetic trick where we can label in green a cell that used to be a fibroblast, and now, if it later looks like a muscle, we know that that used to be a fibroblast, and we've converted or reprogrammed it into a muscle. And you can see here, this green cell beats just like the non-green cell, which was an old muscle cell. And if we look at the, under the microscope, a heart, 
that's not treated, it looks something like this, where this big circle is the left ventricle that pumps to the body, and that blue area is the scar tissue, it's huge, and you can imagine that heart's not doing so well. And in contrast with just the introduction of these three factors, we still see thinning of that wall of the chamber that pumps, but now you can see red threads throughout that scar tissue. Those, those red threads represent newly born muscle that used to be these scar-forming cells. And those cells, all, th those hearts then, if you put the mice in little MRI machines, also beat uh, much harder and pump much more blood. But of course, we don't want to just treat mice. We want to treat humans, but we can't go directly to humans, so we did the next best thing. Here you're looking at a pig heart, where we've done the same thing, and the pig's hearts are very similar to ours. And at the bottom of this heart, the heart's a little wider. That's where the, we've created the heart attack. And what I can tell you right now is, in the last several months, we've treated these pigs, and they were able to pump harder, more blood, and we can create new threads of muscle all throughout that scar region, even in a heart that's as big as ours. And so we're very hopeful that this approach of harnessing your own cells in your body will be a new way that we can consider regenerating cells that have been lost, not just for the heart, but also for spinal cord loss, for Parkinson's disease, for diabetes where you've lost insulin-producing cells, and even for hearing loss where hair cells in the ear are lost. And I have 14-year-old twins who both have hearing loss and wear hearing aids, and they do fine, but I look forward to the day when they can shed those hearing aids and be like every other kid. And I think that day is coming. And so what I want to leave you with is the notion that it is unacceptable for us to just say okay to what we can do now in the human condition right now. But instead, I've never been more optimistic that the world that lies ahead of us is a world where a young man, a young father, can get up out of his wheelchair and chase after his little girl and throw her up in the air. A world where a little girl can open her eyes and look up to the skies and for the first time see the wonders of our beautiful planet. A world where a mother can look at her adult daughter and actually remember her name. That is the world that I think lies ahead of us and I thank you all for your attention and supporting such efforts. Thank you very much.